Thank you. Also thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. This is joint work with Robert McCann. So <clears throat> actually some of this has already been mentioned, but let's just start again with the motivation and look at the Riemannian picture. So there we can uh, characterize sectional curvature bounds by triangle comparisons for a smooth Riemannian manifold has sectional curvature <laughs> bounded below by K if for all small enough time uh, small enough triangles, <coughs> you take, uh, take two points PQ on the side of the triangle, and then you compare the distances, uh, the distance PQ with the distance in a model space of constant curvature K, where I take a corresponding triangle, which has the same side length. This is uh, unique up to isometry of the model space. And if all the distances are bounded below by this distance in the model space, then you say section curvature is bound, so then it's equivalent to having sectional curvature bound below by k, and also same thing for curvature bound above by k. And then you can also define sectional curvature bounds in the semi Riemannian setting. But actually, for a long time, it was thought that this doesn't make sense because if you just write sectional curvature in the usual way and say that this is a one sided bound, then it actually has to be constant. But you just have to be careful and just uh, uh, separate the time like case from the se space like case. So you say a smooth semi-man manifold has sectional curvature bounded below by k if space-like sectional curvatures are bounded below by k and time-like sectional curvatures are bounded above by k. This goes back to Anderson Howard and Alexander Bishop. And then Alexander Bishop showed that you can actually characterize sectional curvature bounds for smooth semi-manifolds in this, in this sense here, again, by triangle comparisons. And this works as follows, that you look Again, for all geodesic triangles small enough, you take two points PQ on the side, and then you look at the sine distance. The sine distance now is the length of the shortest, the unique shortest geodesic connecting them. So it will be positive if they are space-like related and negative if they are time-like related and zero if they're null related. And then this uh, um, triangle comparison holds. And, and the thing here is now, <coughs> this Stopanogov theorem, this curvature condition, this of course makes sense for metric spaces. So if you have a metric, you can do this curvature, this triangle comparison, and this is the starting point for Alexander spaces and cat K spaces. And here you have this sine distance, and this of course is not a metric. So what to do here? And the picture you can have, can have in mind is the following, that Riemann manifolds are a subset of metric spaces. We already seen this today. And, but Lorentzian manifold space times where do they fit? And <clears throat> we set out to answer this question and also in this context, what is an analog of, of Hausdorff measure and Hausdorff dimension because this is ubiquitous for metric spaces. And also one of our motivations was to handle space times of low regularity. So you have still have a smooth manifold, but the metric of low regularity. So for example, just continuous or but maybe you, you don't have a manifold structure at all or no metric, maybe in some, as in some approaches to quantum gravity, like causal set theory, causal fermion systems, or other approaches. And <clears throat> here, that's why we introduced Lorentzian pre-length spaces and Lorentzian length spaces. And if we go back to this picture here, then <clears throat> here should be Lorentzian pre-length spaces in our setting, or maybe bounded Lorentzian metric spaces would be another approach. And Lorentzian length spaces would be the, the analog of metric length spaces. And this allowed us to define time lag and causal sectional curvature bounds, which was also a motivation for us to define curvature bounds for continuous space times where there's, there, there's no re, uh, curvature tensor available. <laughs> but also uh, to answer questions about extendability, to look at what products and singularity theorems. So we already seen that today, but just let me just recall that. Lorentzian pre-length space is a set X with a pre-order on X and a transitive relation less, less contained in less or equal. So meaning if X is less, less Y, then X is less or equal Y. And we put some metric topology on X, but this is not um, geometric in any sense. So you could also say that the topology we have, we have a metrizable topology and for now we just fix this metric D here. And tau is a lower semi-continuous function with respect to this topology which has value zero infinity, but we already saw the convention of Robert today that also it makes sense to allow minus infinity and then you can encode the relation less equal and less less in, in tau. So you just have uh, tau and not the relation. 
but for us, this was since it was motivated for space times from continuous metrics, you have the causal relations and you have the tor, so it is a kind of compatibility conditions you have. So then this is a causal lorentz in pre of space if this tor satisfies the reverse triangle inequality for all triples of points which are causal related. Then tor is zero if they are not causally related and, and positive if and only if they are time-like related. And this is called, tor is called a time separation function. And of course, Smooth space times are an example of Lorentz and Pilian spaces where the time separation function is defined as usual. So you take the supremum of the G length of all causal, G directed causal curves connecting P and Q or zero if they are none. But you can also look for at finite directed graphs as examples of Lorentz and Pilian spaces. So they, <coughs> these are directed. So you have the lesser equal is, is the direction and the time separation is the maximum number of steps you need to reach one vertex from the other. Then you can define causal curves and the length, causality condition, and if tau is intrinsic plus some other conditions, so tau intrinsic means that tau is actually the, given as the supremum of the tau lengths of all future directed causal curves, then it's a Lorentzian length space. We also see, have seen that today, and here's just some review of things which have been done in the past, but I didn't include all the New stuff which we anyway see in this conference only have seen today. So we introduced also a basic causal ladder and then Akehao, Cabrera, Pacheco, Solis extended this to the full causal ladder for Lorentz and Lenz spaces. We defined time lag and causal sexual curvature bounds by a triangle comparison. Felix recalled that today also. Then we also applied this to the question of an extendability of space times. So when can you extend a space time in properly and isometrically into a larger space time? And we were able to relate this in extendability of space times to curvature blow up. So you can say something about um, smooth space times by going to the Lorentzian length space framework because you can say our result, so a classical result is that a space time is inextendable uh, if, it's, if the space time is time-like geodesically complete, then it's inextendable as a C2 Lorentzian manifold. And we can generalize this to saying that, okay, a time-like geodesically complete space time is also inextendable as a regular Lorentzian length space. So if you would have an extension, it cannot be regular. This means it cannot have curvature bounded above in the triangle comparison sense. So it has to have unbounded curvature. This was actually a very nice <coughs> first application. This was joint work with James Grant and Mike Kunzinger. Then we looked at a lot of examples, uh, generalized cones. So these are Lorentz and Bob products of length spaces with one dimensional base. And I established the first synthetic singularity theorem in this setting. This was joint work with Stephanie Alexander and Melanie Darf and Mike Kunzinger. Then we saw this time like Ricci curvature bounds, so back to the work of, of Robert McCann and also Mondino Sur and then Cabaretti Mondino and extended by Brown to the other um, GCD conditions. And also there was a surprising application to contact geometry by Hedeke. And also there is um, the null distance, which is another approach to, another metric approach to Lorentzian geometry, goes back to Somani Vega, which introduced, um, given a, a space time and a nice time function, you can actually construct a metric from this conformal structure. So you really get a metric on the space time. And I think you will hear about that uh, also during the week by Brian Allen. And then Kunzinger and Steinbach showed that you can actually do the same thing for Lorentz and Lenz spaces. If you have a nice, nice enough time function, you can construct also this metric there. And you have some canonical metric for Lorentz and Lenz spaces, or not canonical because there's still a lot of freedom, but you have some, you have this um, null distance also there available. Then also, uh, Richard Garcia Hevelik studied time functions on Lorentz and Pilian spaces and placed the existence of time functions on the causal ladder and in particular showed that this is equivalent to global hyperbolicity, so the existence of Cauchy time functions. And <clears throat> then also a, a question was how you, now you have the, um, the, the analog of the metric space. Do you also have an analog of Hausdorff measures and dimensions? And this was done joint work with Robert. And also recently we introduced angles into this framework independently of Barrera de Oca Solis. And we characterized time-like curvature bounds by this uh, 
an angle monotonicity condition. And today I will focus on this Lorentzian analog of Hausdorff dimension and measure. So let me just recall what the Hausdorff measures are in the metric space. So you have a metric space XD and a set A, delta positive N and dimensional parameter. And you cover your set A by sets AI, which have diameter bounded by delta. And then you sum up the, the diameter of the sets AI to the power N multiply some dimensional constant and take the infinum. This gives you a metric outer measure. And this, and then if you take the limit delta going to zero, you get actually a measure depending on this dimensional parameter n. And this constant here is chosen in such a way that if you're on Rn with the Euclidean distance, you get the Lebesgue measure, the n-dimensional. And then you having these measures, you can define the dimension, the house of dimension of a subset as the infimum of the n such that the n-dimensional measure of A is, is zero. Okay, and then some other motivations since, okay, you can do that for any metric space, so that of course pops up everywhere, but it is a bit in particular important in study of, of rigid curvature bounds in Riemannian geometry. So there's this classic result by Chiga Colding, who studied sequences of smooth uh, Riemannian manifolds, <coughs> which are pointed, so you choose some point Pn and Mn, Say if they are all complete and connected, remain manifolds of the same dimension n, and they have rigid curvature uniformly bounded below, and you assume they converge respect to a pointed group of Hausdorff spectrum to a metric space XDP, which is then a length space, then only two things can happen. So either it's collapsed, meaning that the volumes respect to the GN matrix of the ball with radius one around PN converges to zero, or these volumes actually stay away from zero, then you call it non-collapsed. And in this case, the Hausdorff dimension of your limit space is actually this, this n, and the Hausdorff measure with respect to this n of x is positive, and the so-called renormalized limit measure is actually a multiple of the Hausdorff measure. And this was, this Chiga coding, you can say this was the starting point of metric measure geometry or, or one achievement, and this, Started, uh, started the synthetic lower rigid curvature bound. Actually, Robert already recalled that today. To say that XDM is a CDKN space if it has rigid, lower rigid curvature bound below by K and dimension bound above by N. Um, this goes back to Lord Villani and Sturm. And then there's the Romanian condition to, because you want to distinguish um, CDKN spaces which come from a Romanian structure from saying CDKN spaces which come from a Finsler structure, think as Hilbert versus Banach spaces. And this goes back to Ambrosio, Schindli, Savare. And for these spaces, you can actually say more. So and the Philippe Schigli defined an RCDKN space to be non-collapsed if your reference measure is actually the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. And then, uh, Bruet Samuel, Samuel recently showed that if you have a metric measure space satisfying RCDKN <coughs> with k at just any real number n in zero infinity, then there exists an integer between zero and one such that the, the measure restricted to <coughs> the so-called regular set is absolutely continuous with respect to this k-dimensional Hausdorff measure <coughs> and this regular <coughs> and, and actually m is, is concentrated on this regular set. And also there is the bakri amorici tensor, which we already have seen today, where you add some <coughs> potential to the Ricci, so the Hessian of V is some potential, and this <coughs> tensor here. And this replaces to replace, uh, this amounts to replacing the volume measure by this um, density times the volume measure. And then of course you could also in the non-smooth setting just look at this, where you add this density of the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. And in the, in the Lorentzian case, we now do something very similar. So we take a Lorentzian pre length space, but actually any set with a, with a relation less or equal and some function tau would, would do for this construction. And we look at the causal diamonds, J, X, Y, and we assign some content. So we again have an n dimension and, and par dimensional parameter n, and we assign this causal diamond JXY, the content omega n times time separation to the power n, where this omega n is just some, um, uh, again, some dimensional constant. 
And this constant is chosen in such a way that if n is an integer greater or equal than two, then this, uh, this content is actually the volume of the causal diamond in n-dimensional Minkowski space, which has the same time separation as x and y. And then basically we can do the same construction. We cover our, uh, a set A by causal diamond Ji, which now have metric diameter less or equal than delta and sum up these contents and take the infimum. This again gives a metric outer measure, taking the sub over delta gives then a, a measure, which we call the n-dimensional Lorentzian measure. And there is some dependence on the metric of the pre-length space, but it's rather weak. So as long as these diameters go to zero, so if you change the metric and the diameters go to zero as well, then you get the same measure, but it depends slightly on this, on this me uh, measure, uh, sorry, on this metric. And this allows us to define a synthetic dimension as the infimum over n such that this <coughs> the n-dimensional Lorentzian measure of A is finite. And we can <coughs> make this a bit more precise if we have a better connection between the metric and the distance. So we call x locally de-uniform if tau is a little o of one uh, locally. Then A has synthetic dimension n, if and only if for all small k less than n and large k larger than n, the little k measure of a is infinity and the large k measure of a is, is zero. And therefore you extend that the synthetic dimension of a is just a sub of n such that this is infinity. Okay, so then we can look at zero dimensional measures and one dimensional measures. And we can say something about uh, uh, the connection to the length. So first thing to observe is that if you have a null curve, then the image is actually zero dimensional. Even though in our <coughs> definition, causal curves are Lipschitz continuous, hence the Hausdorff dimension of the image is one, the null, uh, the, the synthetic dimension is zero. <coughs> then if you have a ca future directed causal curve and X is strongly causal, you already seen that today as well. This is, means that the Alexandrov topology generated by the chronological diamond agrees with the metric topology. Then and this bound, the one dimensional measure of the image of the causal curve is actually bounded by the length. And if you have a little bit more, namely that the causal diamonds are closed, as for example happens if X is globally hyperbolic, then actually the one dimensional measure of the image of the causal curve is the tau length of the curve. Also, countable sets are zero dimensional and they're measured by the cardinality. So the zero measure is actually the counting measure if X is strongly causal. And if you additionally have something which um, Felix um, mentioned today, this non-locally time-like isolating, that this would be non-locally null isolating because you want, want that you always have null related points uh, which in space time you always have, and in the Lorentzian length space you also have, but if you're a general um, pre length space, you don't need to have that. So every, for every point in every neighborhood, you have points which are in the neighborhood which are now related to your point, then you can actually show that if a subset is countable, then the, the Lorentzian measure is always zero for n bigger than zero, and if it's arbitrary, if a is arbitrary, then actually the zero dimensional measure is the cardinality of, of A. Okay, and then we can also study linear subspaces of Minkowski space time and see that this is, um, the, um, these measures are sensitive to the, to the causality of the subspaces. So if you restrict the K dimensional Lorentzian measure to a linear subspace, a linear space-like subspace of algebraic dimension K, then actually this Lorentzian measure is actually a mul positive multiple of the Hausdorff measure. So in that sense, in space-like directions, it's basically the Hausdorff measure. But linear hypersurface have geometric co-dimension two. And the precise statement is that you can actually have a splitting. So if you have um, n-dimensional Minkowski space time, and S is a null subspace of algebraic dimension K, which is then of course not N, then the synthetic dimension of S is actually K minus one. So you lose one dimension and the Lorentzian measure splits as, as follows. So you take a null vector mu in S and you write S as 
a space-like subspace R times the span of this null vector, then it splits as a positive multiple of the k minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure times the counting measure. And you can uh, see that in the picture here. Yeah. Uh, that the metric is degenerate. Yes. Yeah. So you can you can see that as follows. So you take so the green thing here is the space like uh, sorry the the, the um, null subspace and and d zero which I don't know for what reason <laughs> we decided to draw it like that is not a the TT <laughs> a direction, and mu is the null vector, which is basic, which can be chosen, or we can set it up in such a way that it's basically E1 minus E2. So then we have here this, um, and we look at delta times V plus T E1, and look at the causal future of this intersected with the causal past of, of this point here, and intersected with S and get this red drop here, which is actually, which contains a cylinder is parallel to this null direction of, of paid delta, and the, and, the, and the radius is actually proportional to the square root of delta t. And if you now then play around with this, uh, with the, with this different scales, you can actually show that you lose this one dimension as compared to the algebraic dimension. Okay, so now we have this, these measures for Lorentzian Pilem spaces, but what about compatibility to the smooth case? And actually we can show it's actually compatible even in the non-smooth case, as long as you have a continuous space time, which is strongly causal and causally plane. So meaning that the causal structure is not too degenerate, you have no causal bubble, which has topological dimension N. Then actually the N-dimensional uh, Lorentzian measure is actually the volume measure. So you that you are completely co compatible. And of course, this implies then that the synthetic dimension is the topological di dimension. This uses cylindrical neighborhoods or actually refinement of cylindrical neighborhoods of, of Kuschel and Grant. Also it uses some machinery of Federer. And it uses a doubling of causal diamonds and the doubling property of the volume measure. And this I think is actually quite important. And I will go into detail a bit here. What does it mean to be doubling or causally doubling. And this works now in continuous space times in these cylindrical neighborhoods. So you have a cylindrical neighborhood W, which is interval time Z, can be chosen to be open connected and relative compact. And it can also chosen in such a way that the DT direction is uniformly time-like on these neighborhoods. And then you have a, a smaller open causally convex neighborhood W prime, which contains this point P0 here with the following property, that you have some kind of doubling axis, which is actually the DT direction in that neighborhood, such that if you have two points P and Q in this small neighborhood, which just differ by the time coordinate, you can choose, you can construct P hat and Q hat by going from Q uh, upwards along this doubling axis by some multiple of the time difference, or some fixed multiple, this lambda is fixed for this neighborhood, and from P you go down the same way, then you still stay in this, in this larger neighborhood uh, W. And also it has a, another property. So let's zoom in into W prime. Then the property we, we want them to have is, or we construct them to have is the following. You have two points PQ in this large, in this small neighborhood, which are time-like related and again only differ on the time coordinates. And you have another such diamond, U and V, which intersect our blue causal diamond, and the time difference is bounded by two times the time difference of this causal diamond here. Then actually, if you enlarge this blue diamond along the doubling axis, the blue diamond, the, the enlargement of this diamond will contain the red one. So, and this is um, fixed in a sense that you can, any two such um, um, diamonds in W prime have this, have this property. And of course, for if you think about balls in the metric case, then this is I don't know, a non-issue somehow because you can, if you have two balls, you intersect them, you know how large you have to weight one to include the other. Just depends on the diameter. 
And also, this uh, everything here can be made arbitrarily small, and you can choose doubly the beam inside a globally hyperbolic uh, neighborhood. Then, the volume measure for a continuous spacetime has the property that it's doubling in this sense that the volume of this double diamond restricted to uh, this neighborhood is actually bounded by a multiple L times the volume of this small diamond, and this L does not depend on P and Q. So this holds for all points P and Q in this uh, neighborhood omega uh, W prime. L just depends on the dimension and, and the cylindrical neighborhood. And then we can define what it, what it means to be locally causally doubling for any Borel measure M. <coughs> um, and it means that it's doubling in the sense that for all cylindrical neighborhoods, there exists a constant such that this double diamond, the measure of this double diamond is bounded by L times the measure of the diamond. The measure of a diamond is positive if the points are time-like related, and the measure of the whole neighborhood is finite. And then we can show that uh, actually a continuous causally plane, strongly causal space-time, if M is locally causally doubling measure, where the local doubling constant L is the same on all sufficiently small cylindrical neighborhoods, then the dimension of M, which is the synthetic dimension, can be bounded actually by the one plus two lambda log of L. And this is analogous to result in, in metric geometry, and this in particular, if you have low Ricci curvature bounds, then you get a bound on the Hausdorff dimension of, of your space. And I don't know how much time I still have. Okay, I was quite fast, sorry. So then I'd like to go into the proof here, because this also shows what you actually need for this uh, causal diamonds, what properties you would need to, um, to preserve if you would would uh, define this doubling for causal diamonds in a general setting. So <coughs> what, what it suffices to show that you only need to cover, uh, to show that the dimension of a small causal diamond J is bounded by this, by this constant here. So in set kappa to the one plus two lambda log of L and in the cylindrical neighborhood. And then you can show that there is actually a maximally T C separated set of causal diamonds, it means the following, that the vertices lie in, in some small neighborhood, W prime, which is again inside the cylindrical neighborhood. The time difference is, is, is T, T psi. And for all uh, the diamonds in this family, which are for all two different diamonds in this family, you either have that the different vertices are not causally rela related or the time difference is large. And you can also assume that they all intersect J. So again, this is this point three would be a non-issue in the metric geometry because there, if you two balls intersect, you have some notion on on the on the distance of the of the midpoint. But if two causal diamond, or if you have two vertices of the causal diamonds be causal related, this doesn't give you any information on the time separation. Then this is set up in such a way that the metric diameter is actually bounded by psi of the JIs and, and also their uh, doubling. Also, you have that the tau's are bounded below by psi and, the, and bounded above by psi because in this, in this coordinates, you can estimate this very well. And now this is a crucial property that these JIs, they are disjoint. So if they are like this maximally separated, then they have to be, be disjoint. And if you double them, you can actually cover the whole, whole causal diamond J. Also, um, by just looking at the ratios of, of, of if you are uh, so if you have the doubling property, then you can only not, ju not just double them, but you do it iteratively and get some, um, some ratio of, of these of this, um, measures. And so you can show that actually the measure of the JIs is bounded below by tau to the kappa in terms of some constant. And then you can show the following. So you know that the, the measure of the whole neighborhood is finite. All of this is contained in the neighborhood. They are disjoint. So you can um, like go over to the sum here. But these are bounded below by the kappa, uh, tau, the time separation uh, to the power kappa. And now this is bounded below by, by this here by some constant time the, the times the cardinality of your index set. So you can actually show that 
your index set cannot be larger than basically kappa to the min uh, sorry psi to the minus kappa. Now you use this to show that if you have uh, if you look at the outer measure, the kappa outer measure of j with respect to this psi, which is this content of these double diamonds because the double diamonds cover cover j. So this is just the sum over the time separation of the of the p hat q hat to the kappa. This is bounded by this by the cardinality of i psi, some constant, and psi to the kappa. So this is some constant independent of psi, finite constant. So you can take uh, psi to, to zero and see that this actually has finite measure and you can apply a previous theorem to estimate the dimension then with respect to this kappa. Okay, and then we can connect this to um, synthetic time lagrange curvature bounds. As I mentioned previously that in the metric case, if you have lower Ricci curvature bounds, this implies that the dimension is, is the house of dimension is bounded above. And we thought we can, this would be nice if we can apply uh, Andreas and Fabio's um, Ritchie curvature bounds to deduce this for, since they have a doubling for these sublevel sets as we've seen in the morning. So the sublevel sets are here, this P power Rx are all the points which are, have um, to actually probably should be Y in I plus of X, which have time-like distance, time-like separation less than R. And then you set ER as the E intersected with the closure of this. And they showed that these sets ER are actually doubling. So you fix one point and take a um, compact set E in the future of I plus of X, uh, union, union X, tall star shape with respect to X zero. So it means that the, uh, the tall maximizers from X zero stay in this set. And this is doubling and this implies, so this satisfies the time like bishop Gromov inequality and this implies doubling. So if you have a globally hyperbolic um, measured Lorentzian length space, so actually this is now uh, redundant thanks to Ettore, who got to put, take that out, satisfies the weak time like curvature dimension condition. Then there exists an L, a doubling constant, which only depends on K and N such that these sets are doubling in, in, in this sense. But this is now not the doubling for causal diamonds as we want. And actually we, we are not able to show that this doubling of the sets implies doubling for causal diamonds. So if anyone has an idea, I'm happy to hear that. But I think it's not, um, probably not true. So, but nevertheless, we could then by some other argument show that we can actually bound the synthetic dimension if we have um, weak time like curvature dimension condition on a continuous globally hyperbolic time like non-branching space time, which is also causally plain. And also the causal reverse structure satisfies this condition. Then we can actually show that the, we know that the topological dimension is the synthetic dimension and this bounds then this um, <coughs> dimension by this N. So this N is really, so this uh, gives some indication that this really is an upper bound on the dimension as, as expected. And brings me to the end of my talk and some outlook. So we had this linear subspaces characterization or description of linear subspaces in of Minkowski. Of course, you could transfer this to, to smooth submanifolds of semi many manifolds. And we expected the same thing to happen there that this is sensitive to the, to the causality of the subspaces. And also as mentioned, how to define doubling for general causal diamonds in, for example, without using coordinates with in general Lorentzian <coughs> free length spaces or Lorentzian length spaces, and there are some suggestions, but I haven't found a way to preserve, preserve all these properties I have. So you want that there. If they're maximally separated, whatever that means, they should be disjoint, but then you double once and you contain everything you intersected before. So this seems to be a very metric, metric thing, and I have, I have no idea how to do that in, in general. And then you can also study the synthetic time like Ritchie curvature bounds now with respect to these particular measures. And this gives you more rigidity. Uh, it's expected to give you more rigidity. You can apply this to also to the singularity theorems. And also there is mentioned there is this Samani Vega null distance and I expect that there's also some uh, relation to, to a Hausdorff measure and dimension induced by this uh, null distance. 
Of course, there you have more freedom using the uh, choosing the time function, and it depends on the conformal class, of, and not just the just the metric. So, but I guess there should be some some um, uh, relation. And then also you could study a causal sets or level sets of of time functions, and restrict the one dimensional measures there, and hope that you get a, a metric on this on this level set. Okay, thank you very much, and, and here are some references. <laughs>